Hello and welcome to episode 29 of the About to Break podcast. Uh, This one is exciting for me, folks. Last week we had uh, one of my favorite magicians, Scott Tokar, on. And right now we have one of my favorite comedy magicians, Dana Daniels. Dana Daniels is the funniest man in magic. I will go on the record right now and say it. Uh, One of the things we talk about in comedy is laughs per minute. You know, the old LPMs. And uh, how how often can you get a laugh within that minute? And this guy, I'm telling you, it's like it's like every four or five seconds. Not only when you're watching his show, but when you're sitting down with him. And I had the privilege of going to his house. We sat down, and his house is so cool. In fact, get a pen and paper. Here's his address. You didn't really think I was going to give you his address, did you? If you would like to hang out with some of the best comedians and magicians in L.A., there's one place to do it, folks. It's this Sunday night, July 2nd at the Nerdist Showroom at Meltdown Comics in Hollywood, California, right there on Sunset Boulevard. We've got the Jokers and Aces show. That's right, the first one was last month, was so killer, we immediately booked another date, and we have an incredible lineup for you folks. The best magicians and comedians in town are gonna be there this Sunday night. Get your tickets right now. Go to the abouttobreakpodcast.com website. Click on live shows, and you, my friends, can get your tickets to the show. I know you're going to love it. I also know you're going to love this conversation with Dana Daniels. Dana got to start working at Disneyland. We talk about that. We talk about his time as one of the Long Beach Mystics. And we talk about his, his stint on Broadway. He just performed in the most successful magic show in the history of Broadway, The Illusionist 1903. Sit back, relax, folks, and enjoy the incredible Dana Daniels. Welcome, Dana. Hi, Taylor. Pleasure to be here oh, in my house. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Th- I'm I'm glad I could. How'd you get in here? <laughs> <laughs> we are sitting in your kitchen right now. That if I just kind of had no peripheral and I didn't know we were in a a home. Yes, this has the vibe of like a '50s diner, a Ruby's diner. It does. It yes. really does. We are in the booth, an actual booth. Uh, yes, There's, like a like a restaurant booth. You have a restaurant booth. You've got the Vindo Coke machine behind In you. Fact, that's a real one too. And you, I didn't even see this guy. This is the drive up order. What do we call that? This yeah, is the that menu. is from Coney Island. Is that really? Yes. That's at least that's what they told me when I bought it. <laughs> that might be a complete lie. <laughs> They're like it's the only one in existence. <laughs> Buy it now while you yes. can. Uh, but that's what that. It's a light up menu sign. That's you incredible. See a old diner. Have you always drive up diner? You always had a passion, a little nostalgia for times past? Yes, yeah, so I always felt like I was born in the wrong era. Yeah. I've always liked Art Deco okay. and all that stuff. It just seemed to have more class to it and more, des- you know, all those buildings that they used to design in the old days, uh, you know, you, just, you look at the architecture and it just seemed like they took more time and more art to it rather yeah. than just building a box, you know. Th- yes. And I realize it's cheaper to build a box, but... It's not as cool. It's not as cool. You know, this. We, we, uh, so we just moved to Upland. We bought a little house in October. And one of the things that drew us to where we're at, because we're right in like the old town, it's all craftsman houses, and you can literally like walk two blocks here in the old downtown area. And it's all old art deco buildings. And wow. I just love it. Oh, I want to go. Oh, yeah. I told Katie, I'm like, we live in a Hallmark movie. It feels, it feels like that. A That's nos- great. A little nostalgic. Maybe I'll move. <laughs> yeah, get over we there. can bring it. Your living room, your entrance area. I'm just welcome to uh, the podcast about Dana's house with Taylor. And Dana. <laughs> no, but I just love when you walk yeah. in. It really does. You walk in and it's like, wow, you're, you're kind of transported. It's got a lot of Disney memorabilia. Yes, and not Disney memorabilia like you would buy at the Disney shop, like things that actually. No, we have that kind of stuff. Yeah, but it's not really displayed. You know, well, you, but you also have some items that were from Disney, like. Actual stuff that was Disneyland would use. Yes. I mean, yeah, I have a love tester that yeah. used to belong in. It was in the uh, Main Street Arcade. Yeah, you know, and when they consolidated the arcade years ago to make it smaller, they got rid of all that stuff. Well, I found out where that stuff went to, and that oh. was the only piece I could get. Okay, which is one of the ones I wanted. For people who don't know, you worked for years at Disney. 
On and off, yes. On and off yeah. at Disney. Yeah. When when was your first time jumping in at Disneyland? Uh, I was in high school. I nineteen seventy nine. Yeah. I was in my senior year of high school, and uh, a bunch of us went down to audition in the character department. We heard the ad auditions, and so we went down there and to audition to be like like you know mascotted like, character like goofy you know and those Mickey guys and that kind of thing or? yeah. Okay. Yeah, kind of stuff. They usually have per, you know parade auditions and they have character auditions yeah. and stuff like that. And how did it go? I got hired. What was your I first? Was, what was the first character you were playing? Are you allowed to talk? Is that I, you NBA? know what? With, I usually I don't. Okay. But we'll just go ahead and do it anyways. I <laughs> you know what do you got? Like how many listeners you got? The, all, dozens, literally. Well, dozens. okay, we'll just keep it between us. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. I got some funny stories here. Um, yeah? Yeah. The <laughs> first costume character I ever did was Tigger. Okay. And it was at a grad night. Now, I was still in high school because this is like, I was hired right around graduation time. So. Okay. Were all, you, and were you as tall as you are now in high school? Yes. Because, okay. I was 6'3". Because Tigger and Goofy, those are, you've got to yeah, be tall. Actually, I'm those. too tall for Tigger. Okay. Um, and I don't know why I was ever put into it, but I did it quite a bit, though. Yeah. But I was actually very tall for that costume. And uh, so my first night doing it, they I'm working a grad night. So I'm still in high school. And so this okay. is another high school's grad night. You know, got it. It wasn't my high school grad night. But so this is like 3 in the morning or whatever. And uh, I'm at, they stationed me at a photo booth over by the Matterhorn. And... All these girls, you know, they're, they love Tigger. <laughs> right. They're hugging Tigger. Yeah. I'm loving this. You're like, this is the greatest job I've it's ever It's a great job. And Can they're imagine. rubbing Tigger's belly. Okay. Now, the way this costume fit on me, they're not rubbing my belly. <laughs> so, to me, now, this is the best job in this the world. This is yeah. the greatest job ever. So, it is. Cool. They found the happiest place on earth. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they said, Tigger, time for a break. Oh, right. no, 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 no. I'm yeah. good. I'm yeah. good. Yeah. One- <laughs> I'll stay here for a You're like, I know the wonderful thing about Tigger. <laughs> <laughs> so, as my daughter's going to her first grad night next week, and I said, Don't rub Tigger's <laughs> belly. <laughs> Downside is during the day, kids like to punch Tigger in the belly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so. So how did you you transition from doing costume characters so, to playing other roles? Yeah, oh, well, I, I got another oh, story to tell you. Oh, sorry, I don't mean okay. to jump ahead. Now let's do my it. first <laughs> parade, because the character department would do some parades. Yeah. So their first parade, they they I was the front end of an elephant. Okay. Uh, the elephants from Jungle Book, and there was two people in these elephants. So I'd be in the front, and the guy in the back can't see anything. And yeah. the guy, well, the elephants were under rehab when we were rehearsing, learning the steps because there was choreography involved. Yeah, and so we never wore the upper part of it. We just wore the the legs. Oh, okay. for rehearsals, you don't we were at rehearsal. You, okay, never had the upper part of it right because yeah, yeah, yeah. they were being all redone. Okay, the very first time we ever even saw them was literally fifteen minutes before parade time. Yeah. On our, you know, here they are. And then they were all, they looked beautiful. And they put them on us and they were incredibly heavy. We're yeah. going, oh my gosh, we're going to do these dance steps and this. And then the other thing was, <laughs> you couldn't see. There was no front vision on it. The only thing you can see was, was down. your feet. You had, to look, right in front you had of you. to look down. Okay. The, no forward vision at all. Yeah. And you're the front. So you're having to leave I'm the I'm scary. Yeah. So it's like, and now here we go. Push you out in the parade. I mean, literally, it was like, and so we and we do this little, and there's three elephants. Okay. And we're doing this, and I was the last was elephant. Is this elephants on parade? Is that like, it's a okay. Dumbo circus parade? Oh, there you go. So yeah. it had all these yep. circus characters. Yeah. And so were the elephants. And Minnie Mouse is leading the elephants down the parade <laughs> route from we Matterhorn Way, which we start the parade starts over by uh, Small World. That's, okay. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. It comes out and it goes down Matterhorn Way. Around the hub and then down Main Street to Town Square. Yeah. And then, you know, exits out that way. So, we're f- them, I can hear the, you can hear the music. And yeah. I'm doing the thing. And we do this thing where, the, where we kind of dance and we do a 360 in the little, all the elephants turn at oh, the same yeah. time. Okay. A complete yep, 360. Yep, yep. So, by the time Which we is get, impressive, you know, yes. because. 
Well, by the time we did our first 360, we were down by <laughs> the uh, what they call Matterhorn Way, where the it's between the Matterhorn and uh, Alice Wonderland. Okay. Yep. So, uh, but I did probably a little overcompensated and did a little more than a 360. Okay. So I was pointing the wrong direction. And I have no idea. <laughs> so the Eller elephants go <coughs> marching away in the parade, and I'm marching off the parade. No. And, and the and guy, the guy behind who's me, in the suit with Scott you. Scott just... Huntley, he's behind me. He's saying, Dana, I don't hear the music. And it's fading. And, I'm <laughs> and, then, we, and then we hit a tree. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> you know, and I'm like going, is it, is it, okay, like, let's go over here. And then I, I see <laughs> tile, and then I hear flushing, and I am in no, the men's room no. along Matterhorn Way. I'm an <laughs> elephant, and I'm like, I go, I think we're in a bathroom, Scott. You know, and then we're backing up, <laughs> no and way. Scott's going, we're going to get fired, you know. And so we back it up, and eventually a security guard comes over and takes my nose oh, that and leads so, me away. So funny. And uh, Can you imagine being the guy coming out of the stall? <laughs> <laughs> There's an elephant. It's a stampede. <laughs> <laughs> didn't get fired. Oh, yeah. I mean, it wasn't on purpose. You, it was you, just out of, you know, we didn't know where we are going. You continued to be the elephant for a while. Uh, that's right. So I, I know I already jumped in here, but when yeah. did you, when did you um, go from being a costume character? Because you played different roles, you juggled and did different things, right? Well, it was never my dream to be like a Disneyland character, although it was... Really great, yeah. It was super fun. fun. It was a lot of fun. But lots of belly rubs. Great <laughs> lifelong friends I made uh, yeah. there. The but my yeah, I thought you know what, uh, be great to do magic yeah. at Disneyland. And I didn't want to work in the magic shop, so I was like, and you had already you've been doing magic for how long at this point? Well, since I was a kid, eleven yeah. years old, and okay. I did it. I hadn't done it full time professionally yet, right? Until Disney really, really gave me my break. But I used to sneak magic tricks out on set, you know, when I was goofy. Yeah. And do stuff. Really? You know, and, yeah, whatever I could figure out I could do with four fingers. Yeah, I fingers. was going to ask, what would you do with the gloves on? How yeah, the you? four fingers and all that. It, yeah. it, you know, I managed. I yeah. forget what I did, but I did, you know, I did something, you know, and then they would stop me and they say, well, you can't do that because... It's not what Goofy would do. Well, it's a plus, you know, if other people are doing Goofy, and then people come back, hey, Goofy, do another magic trick. And oh, can't do okay. Any magic, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyways, they didn't have magicians in the park. Yeah. And then at that time, though, around 1982, they closed Fantasyland, and they decided they were going to redesign it, make a new Fantasyland, and it opened up in 1983. Okay. And so they uh, decided when they opened the new Fantasyland, they wanted uh, to have like jugglers and magicians and stuff like that for the first summer. Okay. And so I heard about that. So I went to the auditions for that and then I got hired. Awesome. For that, you know, and then I left the character department and did that for that summer. And then they continued that program and they really listened to me. They were really great. Cause I've come up with other ideas for other characters in the, in the park, you know, I say, oh. well, listen, could I be a riverboat gambler over in frontier land? I could do some magic on the Mark Twain and do some stuff at the train station yeah. and do some stuff at a table and, Kind of just, and they said, "Oh, that sounds great." And they, and I came up with a character name, called him Ace Diamond, and nice. I put a, and I, I had the best looking costume in Disneyland. They really decked me out. I looked like, you know, Brett Maverick. Yeah, you know, and I had this long black coat and a holster, and I had a gun I twirled. And was it so fun to be able to play a character and do magic at the same time? Yes, like, it was. Uh, doing the Gambler one was one of my favorites. Yeah, it was really great. You know, to just. You know, I had a Derringer in my one pocket, and then I would stuff I really couldn't do today. They really, really feel comfortable, so I'm yeah. walking around with a gun today. But right. uh, back then, you yeah. know, it was, I, I had a, it was a blank gun. I shot quarter, I had really? quarter rounds, and I would boom, and I did a trick where I had someone pick a card, and and I put it back in the deck, shuffle yeah. it up, and I would you know spin the card up in the air, and I bring out my gun and shoot a hole through it. Wow, you know. Their chosen card. Yeah, and this is just after high school that you're doing all of this? Or, well, this, or no, no, this was like, uh, I think I was, when I started doing magic in the park, I was 22. And then I did that for eight years in the park. Wow. Doing that. So the characters I was only doing, I only did it for a few years. You're doing magic in the park, and then you start doing shows outside as well. You said you had not done it professionally before. Well, I did, you know, but just, yeah. um, you know, kids' parties. Right. And, yeah. uh, you know, whatever else I could get. You yeah. Know, there was uh, th that same year, 
that was 1983. I, that's when also when I came up with the idea of doing my act with the parrot. So it was kind of coincided there, uh, and I started getting a lot of recognition oh, yeah. on the outside totally. with the parrot. Well, I wanted to talk about this because at that time, guys were doing bird acts, but nothing like what you're doing. You took an animal, which is always attractive in a show, yeah, and but you gave it this role, this this character. Talk a little bit about how that came about. And okay, <laughs> well, at the time, I was doing a comedy magic act, yeah, and uh, one of the last routines I would do was a. Uh, a Terry Seabrook routine, the bill where the money ends up inside the your wallet in an mm-hmm. envelope, you know. Or no, is that the way it did? I can't uh, really remember the routine. Anyways, uh, you end what you do is you burn up the guy's money in yeah. the pan. So uh, what I my thought process back then was, hey, after I burn the money in the pan, yeah, I'll cover it up and then produce a bird out of it, you know. Okay, for the yeah, big yeah, finish, yeah. you know. Right. And I thought. Hey, rather than produce a dove like everyone else does, yeah. I'll produce a parrot. Did you have a parrot no, already? No, I didn't. Okay. So I went out looking for a parrot that was about the same size as that a dove. That would fit, yeah. Yeah, so that was my mission. I went okay. out and I looked around and I found one. These spectacle Amazon parrots, they're about the same size as a dove. Yeah. Great, so I buy one. First of all, he was completely untamed. He's completely <laughs> wild. So I had to spend time getting him right. tamed. Yeah. That took months and... Uh, Finally, I got him, and we had a you know little relationship. But then I yeah. did, then I put did I got booked to do a show. It was like at a Long Beach. I grew up in Long Beach, Long Beach Yacht Club, and okay. it was for the yep. kids that, of the members. And so I put the parrot inside the dove pan, <laughs> which I quickly found out. Parrots don't like dove pans. No, you know a dove would just go like right. Okay, put me in here. Yeah, one of but the, a parrot puts up a fight. <laughs> well, well, a lot of people wonder, you know, how how magicians started using doves. But yeah. doves, by nature, the they docile, just, yeah, docile, and yeah, you yeah. put them in a quiet place, and they're just going to stay quiet. You yeah, know? And they find, yeah, they come out, and they, yeah. okay, yeah. yeah right. But a parrot, yeah, oh, oh that's funny. So when I produced him, he came out of that <laughs> dove pan with his feathers <laughs> sticking up, <laughs> and he was screaming, and the kids were running in terror. It's a dinosaur. Yeah, he was like. <laughs> You know, and I just thought this is not going to happen. Again. Right, bad idea. Yeah. So I just kept him as a pet. Okay. You know, so I gave up on that idea. So I kept him as a pet, and then uh, one day I was sitting at my desk and uh, pl- practicing with some cards, and I had the bird there with me. You know, yeah. and, what? and he leans over and picks up a card and starts chewing on it, and he yeah. chews a whole corner off of the card. Yeah. And uh, and it gave me an idea for a bit. Right. So. I wrote this little comedy bit where I say to someone, I'm going to read your mind. Or no, I'm going to read the parrot's mind. <laughs> but how can I prove that? Yeah. If you and the bird share the same information, you can verify that I read the bird's mind. Right, yeah, yeah. So I have you pick a card, and then I show the card to the bird, <laughs> and then I put the card back in the deck. Well, yeah. as I'm showing the card to the bird, the bird is chewing up the card. <laughs> you know, and I put the card. You know, so you're, like talk, you're talking to the audience. I'm talking to the audience. You're holding it in front of the bird. In front of the bird, and the bird's chewing up the card. Yeah, and it gets big laughs. And oh, then yeah. I put, and I just act like I'm totally clueless to it. Yeah. But the way I act it is that I am very much aware of it's going on, but yeah. I'm acting like the audience is not aware of it. Right. That's the way I'm playing it. Okay. The audience, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, um, and then I put the card back in and shuffle it, and I go through each card. <laughs> you know, no, nothing here, nothing. And then they yeah. come up to obviously the, the chewed up one, and then suddenly I have the revelation. Wait a minute. And then I ask the audience, do you feel it too? <laughs> and then I ask the guy, was that your card? You know, yeah. that. and it was just a comedy bit. And uh, and I would do it for people that came over to the house. Yeah. I was living, still living at home at this time. Yeah. Know? And then uh, I had, I belonged to a magic club. We talked about the this. Mystics, Long, 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 Beach, Long Mystics. Beach Mystics. And it w- we had a meeting, and it was like my turn to um, host the show that month. And I was so trying- each each time you guys got together to have a meeting, you would do a show. Oh, we always well? had a show every month. Yeah. Oh, I'm, yeah. okay. I'm yeah. gonna get into this too. So he, uh, so it was my turn to host, and they seen everything I do. Yeah. I mean, I would make up stuff, you know, just because of. Putting stuff together to keep your your friends entertained. And, yeah, yeah, we would just kind of goof, you right. know, yeah, sometimes, yeah, yeah. you know. And um, 
So I'm trying to think, what should I do? My mom says, well, do that thing with the bird chewing the car. That's funny. Yeah. And I said, well, it's funny in the living room, Mom. You know, <laughs> but this is on stage. Yeah. You know? And I just didn't think it would. Yeah. And I got, you know, it got closer to me doing the show. And I'm like, okay, I'll try it. Yeah. And Mom was right. I mean, I did it. And it got huge laughs. Yeah. And then afterwards, you know, everyone's come up to me like, going, oh, m- more bird. Yeah, you, really? Yeah, you found it. You found your hook. Isn't yeah. that wild? Isn't it weird how we don't always see the thing no. that works for us? No. I was like, that's all I had to hear. Because I've been looking for my hook. You know, yeah. it was like I was trying to find something to make me stand out a little bit more from the other comedy magicians. Yeah. You know, the first time I auditioned for the Magic Castle, you know, I think I was 21, 22 years old. Yeah. And Peter Pitt used to book the castle back right. then. Right, yep. And... And I and they used to do live auditions there. They would one Monday a month. Really, they had you come in and they put you in front of an, a castle audience, and uh, you and would, you would audition and act right then for and performing. Yeah, yeah, performing auditions. So I did it on a Monday. Came in, did it. My this is before the bird. Okay. And what were you doing at this time? I mean, oh, I was doing all the regular. Yeah. I mean, it was a hack act. It okay. was it was a. Uh, Comedy magic act, all those, all those same gags that yeah. I can't even remember what stock I stock lines, and stock yeah. lines, yeah. Terry C. Brooks, Bill and Wallet, word for word. <coughs> yeah, it, I had a few of my own gags in there. Yeah, but you know, and killed it. Yeah, I mean, you know, they got you know, yeah. and just and I walked out of there so high, I thought, oh, they're going to name the theater after me. <laughs> after that. Boy, I mean, they loved it. Yeah. And Peter came to me and he said, oh, you got great timing. And yeah, you went over well, but I can't use you. And I was like, why not? He's like, what? Did you not just hear what? Yeah. I'm yeah. Like, that's what I said. I yeah. said, were you in there? Did you hear? And he goes, yeah. He goes, but he goes, I got 10 other guys doing the same act. Oh, yeah. And yep. you know what? I yep. couldn't argue with him. Right. I was like, I was mad. At the same time, I went, he's right. I seen them. This, this, <laughs> you know, but this is huge. And I think... Uh, You know, a lot of performers need to hear this because we're attracted to things that we enjoy watching. But if we've seen it already, then other people have seen it already. Yeah. You know, you watch anybody's demo video on YouTube and you can watch five different ones and see the same stuff. Yeah. You know, Booker's not going to be interested in that. Absolutely. You know, and that's what the bird set me apart. So I just, I had to figure out what tricks I could do for Luigi the psychic parrot. And so this, so it started off as this one little trick you did in your a living gag. room. It wasn't even a trick. And then, and then the guys, you do it for them, and yeah. they go more bird. Yeah. And then you have to begin the process of how, because really, you and Luigi on stage, you're it's it's like a partnership. Yes. You're you're a partner with this this animal, and who does really nothing. He does way. nothing. That's yeah. the best part. Yeah. So you're playing like he's kind of like the straight man, you know, and you you're able to 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 riff yeah. comedy with the bird. Yeah. And so then it becomes this thing of how do I how do I what can I do that involves this bird? Yeah, you, you look at all the different tricks there are, what tricks I want. You know, and I just made a big long list and yep. then, and then go, and it was a slow process. Yeah. You know, when I first started doing it, it was you know, the act was very short. Yeah. You know, I was lucky if I could do 15 minutes with it. Yeah. Uh, and there were tricks I wanted to do, but I couldn't figure out yeah. how to incorporate it. Hmm. And then, and then, uh, and then eventually, I came up with you know a good solid twenty minute act, and I did that you know in a lot of different places. Yeah, you know the the castle, the county magic club, and uh, and then I get hired for shows. You know, uh, stretched out to a half hour with some other stuff. You yeah, know? but I was very cautious about. Stepping away from the bird, I thought right. everything had to have the bird in mm, it. Yep. And now, now everything doesn't. You know. No. But I was very, got. He was like my security blanket. Mm. You know. So, uh, it took me a little while to get that comfortable. You know. It's yeah. Like, okay, I'm sticking with this guy. You know. Yep. But but now I step away from it, and he just sits there and does nothing. People kind of forget about him. Yeah. And then I go back to him. Yeah. And uh, yeah. But uh, he said, now I got tons of routines. I do. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. You know that don't even involve him. Yeah. But. It maybe ties in a little bit. So. Yeah. When you so you grew up in the Mystics, and when you're part of the Mystics, did you know at that point that this was a career you wanted to pursue, or that it was even a career that you could have? It was. I. It was what I wanted. Yeah. 
I didn't know if it would be a reality. Mm. Uh, I was also very much interested in photography. Mm. Um, I took a lot of photography classes and stuff like that. And, and all through junior high, you know, I was the class photographer. Yeah. And then high school, I did a little bit of that. But uh, I started concentrating more on performing in high school. Okay. Uh, you know, I took all the classes. My goal was to be in every production that was on our stage. Mm. You know, whether it would be dance yeah. or every, I took everything, dance and everything. And I was even in stage crew. So I was wow. either behind the scenes yeah. or I was on the stage. What was it that first drew you to performance and, and being part of a production? Were your parents ever involved? My mom okay. was a professional entertainer. Awesome. Um, and we're talking, this is like in the 1930s. She yeah. started performing when she was 14 years old, wow. headlining clubs as a comedy dancer, singer. Wow. And... Um, and she was quite successful, actually. Yeah. And and then when she got married in her early 20s, and then she stopped performing to raise a family. Yeah. And then when I was, um, I'm the youngest out of four. Okay. And then when I was, you know, probably around five or six, she started performing again. And but were just, you like, what? My mom yeah. can do this stuff? Well, I mean, you got to... It wasn't that big of a shock, no, yeah. because my mom at home was, it was always, always singing yeah. and dancing, yeah. you know, while she's making dinner and yeah. stuff like that, you know. So it was all everything was a production, yeah. And she was always very funny, okay. Um, so yeah, I grew up with that, yeah. And then she started doing shows, but just not professional shows, just like local uh, production okay. kind of stuff, and. But she became very well known in Long Beach, you know, for yeah. her stuff. They would, you know, she started out just doing the background stuff, and then all of a sudden they discovered how funny she was, and then all of a sudden she was like the star of these shows, you know. Yeah. And then she would. So it was always funny going to the market with her when I was a kid, and then locals would recognize her, yeah. you know. You knew pretty young you wanted to go into entertainment. Uh, no, no, I didn't know if I was going to be entertained. I I didn't do anything until I was eleven years old. Yeah. I was in a car, we were in a car accident and I broke both my legs and, and I went through, uh, you know, I was in a traction, I was wow. in a uh, body cast and in a hospital for months at a time. And that was a magician came up and did a show. Just visiting the hospital? For the kids, like, do it yeah. For the kids? He did a magic show and that's the first time I saw a magician in person. Hmm. And then I... That's you were hooked. I was hooked. I was like, Mom, did I he wanna... sh- Did he show you some, like, how to do a few things, or...? No, he did a show. It's funny, because he had a handkerchief sticking up out of his pocket, yeah. his breast pocket. It was a, a paisley kind of looking handkerchief. It looked real magical looking, and I was... It had my attention for some reason. Mm-hmm. I was like, what does that handkerchief do? Yeah. I mean, he's doing everything else, all his shows, yeah. tricks and all that. And I kept on going, what is he... When is he going to bring out that handkerchief? Wow. Because it looked magical. Yeah. And he never did. And he finished his show. And yeah. then I was in a wheelchair at that time. And I, and I yelled, he was walking off stage. And I said, what does your handkerchief do? I yelled it out. Yeah. And he went, oh. And he grabbed it. And he changed it into a cane. Ah. Oh. And. Wow. And I was like. That was it. That was the moment. That was it. I said, I told my mom, I want to learn how to do that trick. Oh, Where he turned the handkerchief yes. into a cane. Yeah. Because to me, it was impromptu. It oh, was, totally. You know, and it was. Yeah, he had finished was, his show. He wasn't he was, going to. And he was, probably was going to do it in the show, and he forgot. Yeah. And then, you know, and um, and that was just amazing to me. Yeah. You know, and so I, uh, so my, when I finally got to the hospital, which, um, the mom took me to a uh, magic shop. Yeah. In Los Alamitos, which was only three miles from our house, okay. we never even knew it existed, and uh, we signed up for magic classes and bought a few small tricks. Yeah. They didn't, wouldn't sell me the appearing cane. They trick wouldn't sell it because they said I was just too young for that. Just, that's not a that's beginner's. Gr- but that's brilliant. I love yeah. that. That's the way it used to be. It wasn't just we're, yeah. we're here to sell you. Right. It was this is what you no. need right now. I can't remember what my first trick I bought was. Though. Hmm. I wish I could, but you know. I had a little crystal box, like one of those little, it was a little clear box that would uh, make a handkerchief appear, you know, like a little. Oh, yeah. 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 I loved that thing. Yeah, we used to sell those. I, used, I yeah. started working in the magic shop when I was a teenager. So. Yeah. yeah. I just remember spending hours looking at stuff and mom being like, you done yet? I'm still looking. Like oh, there's yeah. going to be one thing I haven't seen. Right. No, my mom would drop me off on a Saturday. Yeah. Like at nine in the morning, 10, whatever they opened. Yep. 
and I'd be there all day. Oh, yeah. I'd just hang out. They had chairs. Right. And you just sit there. And it was so cool because, and I would help out. I'd take out the trash, yep. clean up the glass on the counters. Yeah. And magicians would stop in and stop by. Mm-hmm. And that was always the fun part. And it was just, but to sit there and look at all the tricks on the shelf. Yeah. And then talk to other magicians, older magicians. There really is like an apprentice kind of quality in the art of magic. Yes. You know, there, there is this thing of you see younger guys who are interested in it and you really want to help them. You right. Know? And then when I was young working behind the counter, you know, magicians come in and then they would teach me something. While I'm, oh, yeah. Know, oh, here, try this move. I remember sure. being, being a kid at the magic shop and I would hang out all the time and we'd do like magic club on Friday nights. And I remember the first day that the old man behind the counter... Someone came in and asked to see a demo. And he said, Taylor, do it. And I just remember being like, oh. and I stepped behind the counter and it was like, this is the greatest thing yeah, ever. It is. Like, it, I'm, yeah. I might as well be at the Hollywood Bowl right yeah. now. Like, yeah. there's just something about that. It's, it's like a Santa Claus moment. That, that yeah. A good magic That's trick. A good you know? Analogy. When, when do you feel that way as an adult? You know, but a good magic trick can take you right back there. Oh, it was great. <laughs> Yeah. Do you do you still get that way sometimes when you see, uh, when you see a performance and someone does something that's just creative or unique and you go whoa, oh, do you, do you, you get, get fooled? Yeah, but not even not, not even the fool, fooling, but just the wonder, that sense of like, I'm not even trying to figure this out. I'm just enjoying it. Do you ever you ever get that way still with guys? Oh sure, I love I love being fooled and yeah. I love still and 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 yeah. There's some guys who just create a moment and yeah you, go, you know wow you just took me back to the way i used to feel before i was you know a magician yeah yeah there's uh i wanted to ask because the the long beach mystics here's what's wild to me so i was a i was a junior magician at the magic castle and the long beach mystics is what the junior group at the castle wanted to, like it, it was it was kind of an idea of let's take the mystics and try to do it here. Do you know? Like oh, really? In, in talking, Diana Zimmerman was like, is, "Did she say that?" Yeah, that's what I remember her yeah. saying. Was the was a, not to replace the mystics, but to try to recreate right that experience. Wow! But the difference is, like Castle Juniors, we had all of the mystics to look up to, and they were like the mentors. And what you guys were doing was we were looking toward y'all. Kind y'all, of, y'all. Okay. We also were in Texas at the time. <laughs> oh my goodness! We just had I I pick up accents or like so quickly. We just had friends visiting from <laughs> Oklahoma. Um, I'll edit this out so we sound brilliant. <laughs> um, okay. But yeah, you know, being being a kid growing up and learning, you know, through the junior group at the castle, it seems like all the guys that we looked up to and all the pros were a lot of them were former mystics. And then when you talk to guys about the mystics, it seemed almost like you guys were, who were the mentors that you guys had? It almost seemed like it was this group of young guys all helping each other. Well, some almost of the like older a, mystics. Okay. You know, because we you get, because mystics were like, the ages were like seven okay. to like 21. All right. And when you got past 21, sometimes you just, you didn't want to leave. Yeah. You didn't have too much fun. Yeah. And... And they're all your friends, your buddies, and all that. So a lot of the older mystics would still stick around, come to the meetings. Yeah, and they would be our mentors. Oh, that's you know, cool. like for me, it was, you know, Stan Allen and Mike yeah. Caveney, oh, yeah. Les Arnold. Yep. You know, and uh, Bill Smith, and those were the older guys. Yeah. You know, they're much older than me, maybe ten years older than me. Yeah. You know, but when you're eleven years old and they're twenty one, that's huge. Yeah, totally. I'm fortunate to have those guys. You know, because they're still. <laughs> Huge in the yeah. Oh, yeah. Movie. Yeah. It's wild how many guys who are part of that group are yeah. like the definers of what magic is today. Yeah. We've had people come out from other parts of the country just to join the Mystics. Yeah. You know, like, like Kevin James. You totally. Know, he moved from Michigan to join the Mystics. There, there was a club that started at like a little magic shop or? <laughs> it started in 19, the same year Disneyland opened, 1955. This mm. is before I was born. Yeah. Uh, and it started out of a hobby shop, I guess, that sold magic. Brownies Magic Hobby. Brownies, I think it was called Brownies okay. Hobby Shop, and it was in Long Beach somewhere. Yeah. And that's where, I think that whoever owned the magic shop, the hobby shop, thought, oh, I'll create a magician's group. 
yeah. young kids. That way they'll buy his magic oh, tricks. Oh, they'll come in here and they'll buy magic tricks. Absolutely. It's brilliant. Yeah. So then I don't know how he did that. Yeah. But he got some kids who are interested in magic. And then they were trying to decide what their name was going to be. Okay. And this is what I've heard. I've heard that it was either between the Mystics or the Little Genies. Oh, I'm so glad they went with Mystics. We all are. <laughs> I don't think we would have gotten far <laughs> as the Little Genies. <laughs> the little Genies. <laughs> Who wants to join that? <laughs> <laughs> so that club just flourished, though, yeah. through the years. And it had its down moments and its high moments. You yeah. know, it'd be... What really made it successful was anchoring it to a magic shop. So, like, that's how I found out about it was yeah. when I started taking those classes at the magic shop in Los Alamitos. Right. You know, I saw the flyers for... This that was group, sort of yeah. the shop they anchored themselves to was Got that it. magic shop. Okay. And so a lot of the kids that were going through the member the uh, cl- magic classes were joining the Mystics. So yeah. that's where they're getting their feed from, you know, of all okay. the kids. Yeah, yeah. And then various other ways, you know, like Mark Kalin, who lived in Covina, you yep. know, he just found out about it and he came out and he was one of our big stars. He yeah. came out of the Mystics, you know. But that's he started so out, we were kids, you know, I've known Mark since I was 12. Yeah. And we would compete against each other. I win one year and then he win one year. Yeah. And then he would win every year because he was really good. You know, he stuck with the same kind of act. You know, yeah, he yeah. Really this was doing it. the you pool know, act at the time. That was the beginnings of the pool act. Okay. It was a billiard ball act back Got then, it. and then it yeah. went. Then it turned into the his pool act, which yeah. was really, really good. And it was just so funny because Mark and I just worked Broadway last December, right? In the yeah. Illusionist show. Yeah, totally. And we're now in our fifties, and we're looking at each other, going, "You believe this?" You know, it's incredible. We've known each other since we were 12. And did, and did you have any idea when you were kids putting on these shows that someday... That we'd be on Broadway oh, we'll be in our 50s? Broadway, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, we absolutely Oh, would. good, yeah. good. I just wondered how good it was. A, it was a tele- tele- slow telepathy plan. Was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was like, okay, step one, high school auditorium. Yeah. And then and Rick Thomas, too, was a mystic for a short time. And was so, he really? So, yeah, so the three of us are back there kind of... That's going, wild. Here we are on Broadway wearing fake oh, mustaches. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, and... Uh, but yeah, he grew up in Long Beach too, and then I didn't he was know a mystic that. just for a short time because he he uh, had a lot of other success touring and stuff like yeah. that. So he just who were your influences outside of magic in like the comedy realm? Anybody that you looked up? Oh, to? Oh, Steve Martin, oh, the best. You know, uh, the first time I saw him on TV, I you know I was just getting started in magic. And yeah, I remember my mom yelling for me, "Come in here, there's some guy going to do magic here on the Mike Douglas show." <sighs> and I walk in, I sit down, and then he comes on, yeah, and he has like a magic act. Yeah. But it's just gags. He's not right. really doing any tricks. Oh, yeah. So I was like, Mom, he's not doing any tricks. So I was, I'm looking at it from the magic point of it. Yeah. I thought it was horrible. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I was laughing at the comedy. Right. You know, so I was a little disappointed. But then I was like, who is this guy? Yeah. You know, he was funny. He was, oh, you know, yeah. uh, And so that's the first time he was on my radar. And then a few years later, then he started doing Saturday Night Live. You know, yeah. And then, in the course... You know, the rest is history. But uh, I remember in high school, I used to, um, he wasn't on everybody's radar yet. You know, I was not no. everybody. So I would see him on Saturday Night Live. And this is back when Saturday Night Live would do a guest spot, right? They would have a guest performer. No, he, he was. Oh, no, Steve. Mar- yes. He would host. He would host the show. Yeah, because then- he was becoming very big in stand-up at that yeah. time. And so I would watch him then Monday at school. Yeah. I started doing some of his shtick, you know, and you know, at lunchtime. Oh yeah. So you and make the girls laugh. Oh that's and they hadn't and seen then, the show. And they don't know. And then till <laughs> till a while later, you know, one of them comes up to me and says, Dana, this is this guy on TV and he's doing all your stuff. <laughs> You're like, no really? way. No. I'm gonna kill that guy. Oh man. No. <laughs> so. Was magic your only job ever? Did you ever have like a a regular job? I used to work with my dad. Yeah, my dad had a uh, he was a career Navy guy okay. until I was born, and then he retired. He was in Navy twenty six years, submariner. Okay, did submarines, and then he went into the tropical fish business, where he would set up and lease fish tanks okay. for restaurants, doctors' offices, private homes. And stock them with fish. Yeah. So sometimes the fish tank would belong to them or it was his and he leased it to them. Or he would lease the fish and the yeah. decorations and then he provided a monthly service to keep it maintained. 
Is that a like still a thing? I didn't. Yes, it is. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, yeah, it is because uh, he did only freshwater tanks. He never wanted okay. to do salt water. Because it was uh, just more trouble than it was worth. Yeah. You know, the profit margin or something like that. He just said it was a lot. Of, yeah. So water is crazy. So so it was always, you know, fish tanks around the backyard. Wow. And the garage, Did you ever store. have any crazy fish tank stories? No. Oh. We never had one in the house. Never one. Never. Okay. Never had one in the house. You didn't want to have to take He's care like, of it. I don't want to. That's another That's fish tank to all day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... But I would work with him. Okay. He make you know I, he make me go. <laughs> it wasn't my dream, you know. But you know I'm glad he did because it was you know time with my dad. You yeah. Know? And uh, mostly I was just carrying bags of sand and siphoning fish tanks, you know. Yeah. Doing all this stuff. And then when it came to where he was gonna, either you know he was retiring. Yeah. And I was. At that time, just started working at Disneyland. And, yeah. And the magic stuff was starting to get some traction. Yeah. And he was like, wanted to hand it off to me. And then I was like, Take over the family. I business. was like, going, Oh my gosh, I don't want to be a fish tank guy. Yeah. I hate it. <laughs> I have no interest in it. Zero. Yeah. But how do I tell him? So I just told him, I said, You know, the magic stuff is starting to really get some traction and I've seen and had a lot of success with it. So yeah. I, I think I have to really focus in on this. Yeah. And he was like, that's great. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. He was like, it wasn't a pressure of, like, no, he was like, no, he goes, I just wanted to have something to give you, hmm. you know, if you needed it, you know, make sure I have a, you know, I could do a living. That's beautiful. Because you can make a good living, you know, with it. Yeah. He was probably really excited because he got to sell it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he got some money. That's, so that's what he did. He sold the business. So, yeah. You know, and, uh, so it worked out. Do you remember, was there a time when your, your folks saw you perform and they realized, oh, this is more than a hobby? You know, probably. Yeah. Uh, I never had that question before. You know, when I was, uh, when I started performing at Disneyland. Yeah. Um, and I got their attention once they saw me perform in the park and all that. Yeah. Um, because before that, you know, I was the quiet guy. Mm. in the break area who was goofy out on set, you know. And right. they knew I did magic, but they had no idea of my performing skills yeah. like in that respect. And so then once they saw that, I was also interested in becoming a, doing the comedian in the Golden Horseshoe <sighs> review yes. show, which yeah, was yeah, yeah. a huge step back then. And so I got hired for that. Yeah. And I think once my folks came out and saw that, mm. that was like, you know, kind of a big deal. Yeah. And... Well, that had to be cool for your mom, too, because here you yeah. are kind of... Yeah, because that was a big show. You oh, know, the, totally. The Can Can Girls and the band. And... and when did it go from Golden Horseshoe Review, and then you had your own show at the Golden Horseshoe? Well, the Golden Horseshoe Review, I did its last three years. Okay. In existence, it, from 83 to 86. Yeah. And then they closed the show for was, the reasons and... we don't... I don't Still don't know, why. know? I don't know why. I've heard different rethinks, but I don't know. The Every time I walk in there, I go, there needs to be a show in this space. Yes. So they replaced it with, you know, a bigger show. Yeah. You know, a bigger band, more, bigger cast. And it wasn't, it was a nice show, but it yeah. wasn't, as, it wasn't a well-balanced show. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It was called the Gordon Horseshoe Jamboree. All right. And, uh, and the comedy in it wasn't, uh, I, I don't know. It just didn't, for me, it didn't. They asked me to do that show, okay. and I didn't want just, to do it. It just didn't. I, I said, "Let me see it first, and I saw yeah. it. And I went, "It's not. Doesn't fit me. It was mm. a little too. I couldn't do my own stuff. That was what it was. The Golden Horseshoe Review for the comedian part, you get to do your own stuff. Yeah, and that's Which is why smart. Each you guy know, that came in and did the comic was a little bit different. Yeah, you know, we had Kirk Wall, who was mm -hmm. later became part of Billy Hill and Hillbillies, right." His comedy act was with his fiddle. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dick Hardwick, who took over for Wally Bogue, right. did the stuff with the fake teeth and all that. That was his shtick. And he and uh, and then mine was magic and juggling. Yeah. And um, I didn't do the bird ever in the yeah. Golden Horse Review. There was no time for it because the spot was very short. Right. And the show was so perfectly balanced with the, the, the singer, mm -hmm. the can-can dancers, and the MC who sings, too, but... It, and then the comic comes in the last 15 minutes and gets to destroy it, you know? Yeah. And, and then does a little pickle spill routine at the end mm -hmm. with, the, with the singers and gets to be funny, spitting his teeth out. And, yeah. Um, yeah, it just had a lot of classic moments to it. It was a the show ran 
for, I think, uh, almost 30 years wow. in that space. It's in the uh, Book of World Records as the longest, most perform- running? longest running and most performances of a stage show. Oh, wow. I don't know if it still is. You know, yeah. I mean, something might have taken it over. How many shows a day were you guys doing when it's you were Five around? shows a day. Okay. You know, and then sometimes they had evening shows. Okay. And so, I mean, and then, so there's 10 shows a day. Yeah. yeah. And I did the evening shows. They would, they hired me to do the evening during the summer. Okay. And then I also would fill in for uh, Dick Hardwick when he took over. I never filled in for Wally Bogue. Wally retired by that time. Okay. Before I got in there. But I tried to get in there. Yeah. When I was a character. Oh, yeah. I first saw the show. Uh, you're, you saw it and you're like, I need to do this. I tracked this. Wally Bogue down. And Did I, you really? Yeah, I went to his dressing room. I was wearing goofy shoes and shorts and... You know, and I said, I'm a magician. I like to be your understudy. I was 18 years old the first time I did it. Wow. And he was like, well, you're, you're a little young kid. But, you yeah. know, uh, they had these, he told me about these auditions they had every year for just general yeah. entertainment. In the park. Okay. So I would go. So yeah. Disneyland was aware of what I could do. But I was always deemed a little too young for the part. Okay. Yeah. Then he retired and they hired Dick Hardwick. Dick's about 10 years older than me. Yeah. And then when he got the part, then all of a sudden I seemed to kind of fit in more. And I was older, too. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I was a little more seasoned. And then when that show came to an end, how long until you I guys did my own show? Up? Yeah. Well, that wasn't until 95. So okay. it was, you know, almost 10 years later. Yeah. And had you, at that point, you, had, you hadn't been at Disney after that? or I left Disney in <coughs> 1990, Okay, it was. Yeah. Well, they discontinued the Jester program. I wasn't working that much there anyway. I cut myself down to three days and then yeah. one day. I was getting a little burned out Yeah. Um, from the street performing aspect of it. it yeah, was just, it's, it's, and I, plus, I started doing more stuff that was kind of taking me away from it. Yep. And I was wanted to be available for that because you know, mm-hmm. I was turning down Vegas right. things. And, you know, it's like uh, I would go out and do short stints in Vegas. Yeah. Because the actor, the bird, was getting popular. Right. And I was doing some TV shows and yep. even at the improv and all those shows back then. That's always been, for me, is a, a little bit of a balance is when you have an opportunity to do something that's like a steady, a yeah. steady gig. Yeah. That's not as high profile or as high pain. No. But it's like, oh, this is consistent money. But then if I take that, then I have to say no when something else comes up. Right. How have you managed that? Um, <laughs> It's very difficult. You know, it's like, yeah. well, back then it was, I just, because I loved my, I had a relationship with all these people right. I know at Disneyland. So oh, it's yeah. hard to leave that. It's like family. Yeah, it's family. And I've always been about balance and trying to, yeah, you know. So, yeah, I've turned stuff down that probably would have been great for the career. Yeah. You know, just to make a living. It wasn't about being famous. It never right. has been about being famous. Right. And, or being rich. And yeah. so far, my plan's working perfectly. <laughs> to not be famous. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm doing well, you know, but it's, mm. uh, you know, that's never been about, you know, that's trying, not the, try, it's the, not the, trying to be a star, you know, yeah. to me, it's never has been. So I just want to be in front of an audience yeah. and get paid well yeah, and then have a family right, and be happy. You know, I want to have have it all right and i don't want to be taken away so much you know it's yeah like, you know last few years with some of the stuff i've been doing right i have been taken away quite a bit but my yeah. kids are older yep but i have conversations with my wife about it i was gonna say what's that conversation like when you get a call to say we want you to do the illusionist in broadway or australia or you know yeah and you realize i'm gonna be gone for a month or more uh, three months three months yeah what was that conversation like? It was, <laughs> usually it takes place out in the jacuzzi. That's a good place for conversations. You know, my wife and I go out there. And yeah. I, I didn't remember, we did it a couple times. You know, yeah. I'd say, this is going to be going, like the illusionist came to me and yeah. wanted me to go to, uh, you know, the Middle East, Dubai, yeah. Abu Dhabi, mm-hmm. Doha, and then from there, go to Australia. Yeah. And I'll be gone over Christmas Right. Which I've never done before. I've never wow. been gone On from my Christmas. home over Christmas Day. Yeah. And then it would go into January as well. But it was like, you know, I've been home every Christmas. And she was right. like, that's a great opportunity. Mm. You know, uh, and today we have, you know, FaceTime. Right. Stuff yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So we can talk to each other 
a lot that way. And then Christmas morning, do Christmas over FaceTime. I'm yeah. like, you know, but she goes, I don't think you should miss this opportunity. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's in the grand scheme of your life. This is three months. Yeah, it's true. You know, and it's not like I'm doing it all the time. So it's right. So we thought, okay. So I accepted it and yeah. did it. And it was funny because I was in Australia. I was in Sydney. We were working in the opera house. Yeah. It, during Christmas time. And, Unbelievable. Yeah. The Sydney Opera House. Oh, sorry. It was, it was I'm sorry. I just, I went to Cleveland for our city. <laughs> so, and I literally did Christmas morning. I forget what time it was. We're in Sydney. I think it was like four in the morning for me. Yeah. But the next day. <laughs> right. You know, so, um, but I had Christmas morning with my, my family. Yeah. They put, you know, I have my barber chair. That's my seat. Yeah. You know, Christmas morning. They so put the they computer put the, in the oh. barber chair and they just peeled it around like a see what, Who's opening what? And wow. then they opened my presents for me. Yeah. And I looked at them and went, oh, that's great. You know, da, 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 like that. And afterwards, it felt like I was there. That's it was really so amazing. Cool. I mean, it really did. I felt like I just spent Christmas morning. It is, it is weird how, because of technology, we are so, we have the ability to stay connected yeah. on the road. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, FaceTime has been a huge deal for us. Yeah. You know, when I had to be gone or miss things and yeah. stuff. It's really fabulous, and then uh, and then this last, then the, you know the illusionist came back again. That's yeah. when you Broadway, yeah. And we had the same conversation, but this yeah. one was like, okay, this is Broadway. It's Broadway, and she, Jane was like, go, yeah. Go. I mean, how many? How often are you going to get an opportunity to no, do never. magic on Broadway? Not me, not with a, you know. So I was going to be gone at Christmas again, again. Yeah. But they came, they had the chance to come out and see me. On oh, this one. cool. So the family came out. Yeah. To New York. And these are huge venues that you're doing. I yeah, mean, this was a palace theater in uh, Times Square. What is that like to walk on a stage that Houdini performed on? Uh, it's um, humbling. It's um, the Marx Brothers worked yeah. that stage. You know, yeah. that's the one I got excited over. Oh. You know, I'm, a, you know, I love you know, Houdini too. Yeah. yeah. But the Marx Brothers to me were, oh. I grew up watching their movies. And, totally. And uh, this Palace Theater was a vaudeville stage, the premier vaudeville stage in America back then. Wow. And so all the acts, you know, Will Rogers and all of those guys, you know, came through there. And yeah. their dream was to work the palace. Yeah. And so it was, you know, look at, I'm looking at the floorboards. I'm looking at everything. Yo, I'm totally. looking at the dressing rooms. I'm going, these are the same dressing these rooms. Ones. This is the same rickety elevator these guys went up and down in. Because all the dressing rooms are on different levels. Oh, they, okay. They, like my dressing room was on the fifth floor. Wow. So you just got to wonder, well, who was in here? Right. You know, I don't know. But, you know, it's like you have to take this elevator to get down to the, or the spiral staircase. You wow. Know? And it was, you had to plan ahead. That's incredible. For your cues, you know. Yeah, right. Make sure you don't like, miss the like elevator. You, yeah, because it's quite a journey oh. to get from the, your room to the stage, at least from my room. Yeah. You know, any performances on Broadway, any funny things happen or things stand out that you'll remember? I talked with yeah. Mark recently, and he said it was such a whirlwind that it's, he's like, there was so much going on. It was almost hard to enjoy it until it was over and then go, wow, we just did that. Yeah. It was, well, we did a lot of shows. Yeah. Uh, at, you know, when we first started, it, we had a few days off. But when we yeah. got into the season, the holiday season, we were doing every day. And we were doing three shows a day. That's incredible. Which is really unheard of in that theater. The crew was oh, like yeah. saying, we've never done these many shows. <laughs> and we're going, well, we're magicians. We're used to that. Oh, yeah. Know? But it was tiring, you know. Yeah. It was like you come in and had a few hours, maybe between shows. But yeah, you know, back in the makeup, back in the put the mustache back on, and but a one, like literally a once in a lifetime. Yeah, I mean, it was so much. The, the theater was just beautiful. Yeah, and uh, it the theater really fit the theme of our show yeah. really well because our show was turn of the century. You know, the the uh, so the early 1900s is mm. the kind of look we have. Yeah. So we fit right into that theater. It just it was, it was like great. it was like it was built for it. Yeah. I had one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was you're one of the few performers that I know who can jump into a Broadway theater, but could also perform at Disneyland. Could perform in a corporate ballroom. You as a performer and your act translates into all these different environments. Yeah. How much planning went into that and how much of it was just getting opportunities to do these different type of gigs and learning what it took to do it and what worked and what didn't? Well, that's, yeah, it's, uh, 
nice observation there. I, <laughs> that's pretty much on purpose. I always kind of wanted to fit everything into one suitcase. Yeah. Which kind of limits you. I mean, and I have right. to say, I have, I do have more than one suitcase now, but, uh, you know, for certain things. But um, I wanted to be able to fit in any situation and be able to perform in any situation. Yeah. You know, because I did a lot of corporate events and stuff like that, and you show up and it's all sorts of situa- oh, situations. Oh, you, you never know what you know. to expect. <laughs> Even when it's in the right, <laughs> you know, it's a very no stage, right. and no lighting, and you got mirrors behind you, yeah, and tall centerpieces, and well, you know, I've been on all that stuff. You know, the I did a corporate event out in New York one time, and this stage was, uh, you know, I requested this. You know, I have a writer, yeah. you know, stage, and you know, preferably adequate no, lighting, preferably and... no dance floor in front of me, yes, and da 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 da, you know. And I get there, and it's like they didn't read the thing. You know, there's a dance floor in front of me. And not only that, on the other side of the dance floor is a bar, and the audience is on one side. You know, no one's uh, in front of me. Except for when they walk across to get a drink. Right. So there's, it's like terrible for magic. And then when I got there, yeah. the DJ set up all his stuff on the, on the stage. So there's, so there's no, no room. room. The so, stage is here for the magic show. Yeah. And then they tell me they're going to be eating during my show. So everything, okay. everything's going wrong. Yeah. I've done this gig. Yeah. <laughs> what do you, what do you, so what did you I, do? What did I do? I got the guy that hired me and I said, you brought me all the way from California yeah. to do this. And I said, I told him all this stuff. I said, this is like the worst possible. Yeah. The show's going to fail. Right. The way it is right now. Now. Here's how we can fix it. Hmm. Okay. Yep. Um, I'm going to have the DJ, although he's going to put up a fight about this, move his stuff over a little bit. I'll share it with him. Yeah. Just, I don't need too much space to stand on that stage. Yeah. And all that. So we did that. And then uh, I said, then we're going to have uh, an announcement. First of all, we're going to do this after dinner. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then we'll have, uh, and then we'll have an announcement. And then. We'll have everybody pick up their chairs, bring them on the dance floor, yeah. and set them up theater style. Yeah. I said, and we're not going to tell the hotel we're going to do this because they will, they'll, they'll charge you extra money or they'll put up a no, fight. No, because they, they don't, don't want, want chairs, chairs on, on the dance, dance floor. Yeah. So we're not going to ask permission. We'll ask forgiveness. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I love it. And then. I love it. Uh, and then uh, what I did. Because I did strolling magic earlier, mm-hmm. so everybody already kind of knew me. Which helps in those kind right. of So I walked yeah. around while they're eating and yeah. went to each table, and I said the same thing to each table. I said, listen, uh, after you're done eating, I'm going to do a show, and uh, they're going to make an announcement for people to pick up their chairs and walk them out. I said, if you could do me a big favor, if you guys could be the first ones to get up there and do it, that way everyone else will follow you because people are hesitant to do that. Yeah. And they said, okay. So, but I told every, every table, table the same thing. So when they made the announcement, it was like, boom, it happened so fast. So cool. And so good. And had a great show. Got a standing ovation. And we had a great show. I love that. And I was like, oh. I love, and that's, that kind of stuff is huge because so many guys would get in that environment and be like, well, I guess, what am I going to do? I'm, I'm stuck. Yeah. But you say, no, I, I'm going to do the thing that might seem awkward for 20 seconds to move all these chairs. And no one's going to remember that. They're going to remember the show killed. That's right. You know, but uh, no, not every show is a killer. You know, I had the uh, the one where I showed up and, and everyone's speaking Chinese. Yes. And and the program, mm-hmm. the only English words in the program were Dana Daniels. Dana Daniels. And I want to hear this. I've completely set up my act and the people on the stage are talking. There's people eating. Yeah. And then... I'll, I am literally standing back there with the bird on my finger for an hour because I have no idea. I can't read the program. You don't I don't know, know when, when you're I'm supposed up. to go on. And then all I hear is Dana Daniels, and then I yeah. ran out there and died for forty-five minutes because no one knew what you were saying. They spoke English, but not very good English, and mm. so the comedy didn't didn't play. Yeah, and it was just. Horrible. I felt terrible taking their check, but I took the check. You took the check, yeah. You earned that check. That was work. This Christmas, and it's funny, I had another instance where almost nobody spoke English, and so that became part of the writer was, you know, in instances where the audience is not primarily English speaking. Hire a band. (laughs) (laughs) Mine says call Dana Daniels. No. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> so anyway, so I go to do, do the show, and it was the same thing. It was about 80% of the audience didn't speak any English whatsoever. And everything could have gone wrong, went wrong. And I just got up there and did terrible for, you know, and I just what did what you got to do. Yeah. Well, and it was, this was at Christmas time. So this was right after the election. And the guy gets on stage and did this whole thing. He, the owner of the company, and it's a well known company, got really, really drunk. Oh, no. Got on stage to introduce me. Oh, no. And said, Well, we'll see what happens now. <laughs> and then just walk off. <laughs> And then yeah, it was one of the it was one of those things where you like clicking your heels like I just want to go on. Oh, I was clicking my heels, man. <laughs> How do I get off the stage? Yeah. Is a theater audience your favorite? Is it a family audience like you would do at Disney? What are the ones that you tend to most of the time go, that was really fun? I don't know if there's any particular favorite. Yeah. Uh I put last place a room full of teenagers. <laughs> But uh, even the room full of teenagers, I've had an occasion of pretty good, you know, here yeah. in my living room with my, my daughter's friends. Yeah. Know, pretty good and going off pretty well. But yeah. Um, see, at Warren Annabelle's in oh, Maui. Yeah, yeah let's talk about Warren. One of my frequent, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I love the audiences there. They're from all over. All over, yeah. Yeah. And uh, the ages are real mixed. Yeah. A lot, mostly uh, probably more 30 and above. You yep. know, or even more than that. I, I love that. You know, the th when they're seated to see a show, mm -hmm. you know, rather than me trying to hustle up a group or something. Right. Like that, you know, but the uh, corporate events are yeah. a lot of fun. But you know, sometimes those are they can be rough depending on what industry it is. You yeah, know? that's true. Yeah, you know, if you got a bunch of scientists in the audience, yeah, sometimes they're just terrible because they're, they're trying, just to trying to analyze everything you're right. doing. You know, whatever. and it's funny, even if even if you do fool them or impress them. They don't. They don't like to look like they yeah. don't know what's going on. Right. So they won't react. Yeah. But like Midwest audiences, I love. Oh yeah. You know they're great. Yeah. Um, and family audiences, yeah. like in you know we do like outreaches for churches and stuff like that. Totally. Yeah. They're just a blast. Oh, you yeah. Know? They're like with you. So. Want to have a good time. Yeah. I and, I and I adapt my show to every audience too. I'm not sure you do. Yeah. You know, it's just like a little bit. You know. Yep. You know, there's kids. Right. You, you go, know. oh, I'm going to throw this. Well, I'm going to bring I'm a kid up and do something, yeah. you know, for the, for the kids. Yeah. And, but the audience will, uh, adults will enjoy it too, you know. Yeah. You talked earlier about balance. You and your wife having the hot tub meeting to figure out, okay, what are we going to do about this decision? Have there been moments, I know there have been for Katie and I, where you realize we should have had this conversation three months ago because it's been really hectic or crazy. How do you adjust when you find out that maybe you've been traveling a little too much. Yeah, we have lots of discussions about it. Uh, Warren Annabelle's in Maui takes me out of town four months out of the year. Yeah. You know, spread out through the year. So, right. But it's only two weeks at a time, you know, yep. two or three weeks. And then the summertime, I'm there for six weeks. Yeah. And then, but usually, you know, Jane and Heather yeah. come out. That's great. For a part of it. You know, it's, so it's not so bad. You yeah. Know, the only time I felt really lonely, like being was when I was actually doing Broadway. Mm. Uh, even though they came out for a, a, about a week and a half, yeah. my family, after they left, I, I started feeling really lonely. And it was, I, I think it was because it kept us so busy. And then on a little bit of downtown time, all the other acts had, they were a couple acts. Okay, yeah, yeah. Mark yeah. and Ginger. Right. Uh, Rick and Tara. Yeah. Charlie and, and you know yeah. and Sherry, uh, everybody had their significant other, other with them. Got it. Except me. Yeah. And I was, you know, and I it was like, I boy, I walked the streets in New York there, and I'm like going, wow, I wish yeah. Jane was here. I see this. You yeah. Know? I mean, she was there for a little bit, but the rest of the run, I was like, I'm ready to go home. Yeah. I was just feeling uh, it was hard to enjoy. The experience because of that, you know. Mm. So that it, I, I I can't imagine what it's like doing a run that long. But even even some of the corporate travel, people don't realize. You know, you're. It's like you get on a plane alone. You go to a hotel alone. Yeah. You, you know, it's and sometimes that's nice. Sometimes it's like oh, I'm just gonna go see a movie tonight. You know. Yeah. But it is a weird thing where sometimes it takes two days to get there and back to do a, a 45 minute show. Right. But you know what I always did was keep track of where I go. If I see some place that's fun, 
Oh, that's then I'm cool. going, oh, we're going to come back here for a vacation, which we just did. I just took Jane to uh, San Antonio. Oh, that's Because I've been great. there a few times. I've been there about three times for yeah. corporate events and do the river walk and go, mm-hmm. this is beautiful. And I go, Jane would love this. And then I thought, so we just, I, like I had some time off. Yeah. This month has been, you know, I'm home a lot. Yeah. I said, let's go to San Antonio. So we used all those miles we've I've occurred. And, you know, yeah. And then we... Uh, went to San Antonio, and then we just went to some little towns in Texas, so they, little tiny towns that have old buildings, and yeah. had a great time. Oh, we just did so it for good. about five days. You know, that's the benefit there. You get to see a lot of places. You can go, oh, let's yeah. revisit this. You Anywhere know. you want to travel to that you haven't yet? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, yes. Uh, I have never been to, like, the Netherlands. Oh, you yeah. Know, I've never seen any of that so i would love to hit that part of europe awesome yeah that'd be really cool so so we'll get there one day so one day yeah if you're listening and you're from the netherlands that's right dana is available in the netherlands that's right can't even say it in, yeah. the, in the netherlands netherlands in the netherlands yes just supply me a bird <laughs> right <laughs> yeah. oh, let's talk about that traveling as a performer is yeah. challenging with luggage and gear and all this what Interesting things have you run into traveling with an animal? <laughs> well, uh, recently, not so much. Okay. Uh, through the years, I got it down. But when I first started doing the act with the bird, I didn't really travel that much. I mostly was doing local shows yeah. and stuff like that. And then years later, I started doing um, corporate events. You know, I had to get a health certificate, and then I had to get a thing where, you know, he would either fly below... Okay. You know, in cargo, which I was never was comfortable with, or he'd right. fly on board with me. But back then, not too many planes would allow that. Back would then. allow that yeah. bird to stay with you. Right. And then not all airlines would even travel with a, an animal. Yeah. You know, this, I'm talking, this is like the 90s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then I started resorting to uh, smuggling. You know, <laughs> Contraband? Sneaking them on Contraband board Contraband Luigi. Yeah. How did you sneak him on? <laughs> so, you know, I did I did this, uh, I used to do this routine. Well, I still do this routine once in a while, uh, where I make him vanish. Yeah. On oh, stage, and then he's on And then your, I turn on, around on and, your he's, and he's yeah. hanging on my belt. Yeah. So what I would do was put the cage in a bag. Yeah. And I take, I go in like a bathroom. Yeah. And I take him and I would hang him on my back of my belt. He just grab onto it. Yeah, he just hangs on there. And and then I would untuck my shirt or wear a jacket. Back then you could wear a jacket and walk through. And uh, so he's covered up. <laughs> and then I would walk up to security and I'd put stuff through the x-ray thing and then I'd walk through the metal detector. Yeah. And, and he's hanging on my rear yeah, end. You know, and then i get the burger. stuff and then I'd go back into a bathroom and put him yeah. back in his cage and then walk on the plane and he'd go underneath the seat. Yeah. Yeah, like that. So I did that many times. It was always... <laughs> <laughs> nerve wracking is right because you're like yeah and then sometimes I'd be walking through and he'd make a noise you yeah. know like that and then I would have to just like replicate the noise right bah, you know. <laughs> never got caught okay until <laughs> um, I was flying out of uh, Columbus Ohio yeah and I was wearing a trench coat it was during the winter time and I think I did a New Year's Eve gig out there at a yeah. hotel and so it's a, so I'm flying back and and I might thought, oh, you know what? I, he could probably fit in my pocket in this jacket because it's got huge side pockets. Okay. And I, that way he doesn't have to hang. Oh, he'd just come you know, free, just you know, curled up. Yeah, he'd just be yeah. just sitting there comfortable. So yeah. I stick him in the pocket <laughs> before I walk into the airport. I get out of the cab, stick him in the pocket. And then I go stand in line to check in my suitcase. Yeah. And as I'm checking in my suitcase, the guy behind the counter is typing on the computer. And he looks at me and he says, uh, you want to check in the parrot? <laughs> and then I'm looking at him going, and I'm thinking in my head, man, why? How does he know I have a parrot? Yeah. Did he see my show last night? Yeah. It's all going in my head, a million miles oh, an yeah. hour. I'm, oh, yeah. Maybe he's. And I'm like, you're in headlights right now. I'm going, well, how does he know? So I play it off. I'm going, what parrot? So maybe he's thinking like the wrong right. guy. Oh, yeah. Because I'm thinking that's how he knows. He saw right. my show. Yeah, yeah, how yeah. could he possibly have oh, yeah. a parrot? And then he says, stops typing and he looks at me and he says, the one on your shoulder? Uh, the you bird. Know. I didn't know it, but when I was waiting in line, crawled Luigi out. crawled out of my pocket, <laughs> up my back, and is sitting on my shoulder. That's fantastic. So I'm staring him straight in the eye, and I'm saying, what parrot? With a parrot on my shoulder. <laughs> and then great. he says, the one on your shoulder. And yeah. I'm like thinking in my head, I didn't want to look over. 
And I'm thinking, oh, dear God, no, please, right. no. And I look over, and there's the parent on my shoulder. And I said, oh, him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, he's here to see me off. Yeah. He's here to me. He That's cracked terrific. up, and he just gave me my ticket. Just he let, says, you, let you roll. He said, have a nice flight, Mr. Daniels. And I walked off mortified. And I was, and I, you know what I did? I was like, put Luigi back on my butt, and I snuck him through security that way. Oh, my goodness. So I guess he just figured, well, if I can... Yeah. Get him on the plane. God bless me. So has it? Is it? It's gotten easier as of recently. Well, after nine eleven, right? After nine eleven, uh, security they don't look for animals. They don't. Wait, well, they're looking for stuff right. you take over a plane with, unless right. a terrorist takes over a plane with a parrot. Right. They're not. You know, then about. I'm safe. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, they, they're more security now than because back before right. that, the security used to be more. Work for the airlines and stuff like that. Right. So if you did bring oh, yeah. an animal through, they would say, "Oh, do you have what airline are you flying?" and all that kind of stuff to make sure. Yeah, and I did everything legit. You know, back you know, at some after nine eleven, I did everything legit. Oh yeah, and I would only fly. And well, magicians, we have weird stuff. But too, now they right? kind of let animals, all sorts of animals on oh, board yeah, planes. Totally. I mean, it's crazy with the. Uh, Oh, yeah. With the, the service animals. Service animals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's a service it. parrot. Oh, yeah, it's a service yeah, parrot. It's my emotional support parrot. I'm very uncomfortable leaving the home without him. <laughs> Did you have one time where somebody read your note? From oh, your <laughs> that was, go- yes. I was going through security at uh, LAX, and uh, I do this trick uh, where I get information from the audience. <laughs> You know, like uh, name, uh, you know, may, name a state, name how much change in your pocket, and all that, and all this information that comes from the uh, audience ends up in this letter from Luigi. Yeah. Okay. The parents written yeah. this letter. Out. So uh, I had one of these letters <laughs> folded up, and I carry all my tricks in these see-through bags, and I yes. always have them in my carry-on. Brilliant. I don't. I, don't I check totally them. stole that idea from you, by and the way. And I got it from Billy idea. McComb. Oh, right. So, so the uh, the letter is I had some pre-made, and you know I wrote them up before the show, so they're just ready to go. The opening line in the letter, though, is like I build the whole routine up. Like, and what does Luigi say? Like, it's a big prediction. And, yeah. And, and the the first lines of the letter are, "Help! I'm being forced to do this against my will." It's like a you know like Luigi's being forced to do this act. Gets a good laugh, and then the rest of the letter right. has all the information that yeah. people just gave from the audience. And yeah, it's a totally. Great, it's a great trick. But it starts off with a very good laugh. I had that folded up, and it's inside this see through plastic <laughs> bag, and it's in my carry on. Yeah. And my bag, probably like yours, always gets flagged always. because you're carrying all sorts of weird oh, things. Oh, yeah. So he goes, Sir, do you mind if I open your bag? Yeah. And I said, Certainly. And I'm putting the parrot back in his little cage because yeah. I carry the parrot through on my finger now, yep. you know, because they don't care. Yeah. And da 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 da. So I put, and, um, he opens the bag, and sitting right there on top is this letter. And the only thing you can read on it is, help, I'm being forced to do this against my will. Oh, my God. And he's looking at it, and he's looking at me, and I have no idea what he's looking at. And he says, sir, are you okay? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. That's <laughs> Oh, because because yeah. when they're looking through your suitcase, you're not allowed to touch anything, so you can't even see. What yeah, he's well, I'm not at. even kind of that close yeah. to it. You know, I'm yeah. still kind of. And then he tilts it towards me, and he's pointing at it, but not looking down at it. And he's like, "Sir, are you okay?" <laughs> he thinks I'm trying to send him a message, but yeah. not be like, noticed covertly, because yeah. maybe. I'm uh, being forced to do something yeah. against my will. He's like, this is what I trained for. <laughs> yes. He's getting very excited. He's going to break. This is it. This is his moment. Al-Qaeda is going this down. This is it. <laughs> They're holding my family hostage. Yes. Yeah. And then I was like, what? Oh! And I was like, yeah. no, no, no. That's a letter from my parent. Right. And yeah. I just realized what that sounded like. <laughs> <laughs> said, my my oh. bird writes me. <laughs> yes. And I said, no, there's a stack of them in there. I had to explain the whole thing to oh, him. Oh, that's and, so funny. And he got a good chuckle out of that. Yeah, it's so. always fun when you have to do an impromptu show for the TSA. Oh, I've done magic tricks <laughs> yeah. for the TSA. I've juggled for the TSA. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What's this bowling ball? Really? They make you juggle? I juggled the bowling that's ball all the time. That's fantastic. Like, Give me two objects. I'll They're you. like, I, you're, you're like, I juggle, because you do a routine where you juggle a bowling ball and two random objects. Yes. What is the weirdest object someone's given you or the... Toughest object. Oh my gosh. To a slice of cheesecake <laughs> and a potted plant. Are you serious? A potted plant. <laughs> Where did they get a potted plant? They, they just, just grabbed it. It was a corporate event. They just grabbed it from the corner, it belonged to the hotel. 
and it just went everywhere. Dirt <laughs> flew. The leaves, everything just died. The cheesecake would not leave my hand. <laughs> and the bowling ball came across no and landed on it. <laughs> and then the cheesecake just went all over me. Uh, a bottle of champagne, a full bottle of champagne, which was really heavy. Oh, yeah. And I, boy, that that's one. That's got to be scary when you're doing a was bowling scary. ball next to a glass yeah. bottle. And that was, that's why I don't do glass anymore. Yeah. Because I, I have broken glass. Yeah, I did it at Harris. Harris won't let me juggle glass anymore. <laughs> I, I shattered. I forget what it was. Something on stage. Oh my goodness! And it went out into the audience. But fortunately, there was no one sitting in that section. Yeah. And after that, they said, "Yeah, no more." So I went, "Okay, yeah, that's fine." You know, I was always scared to do it, anyways. And then, uh, but the, the champagne bottle, I remember flipping that up, and I caught it just like a like a juggling club just before it hit the ground. I <sighs> and I couldn't see the lights. Yeah, and I was just stuck my hand out there hoping I caught it because wow. it would have just burst if it Ugh. hit the ground. Caught it though, I caught it, and then uh, I don't know. I've had oh, oh yeah, I remember the glass that broke at Harris was yeah. a full drink. It wasn't an empty glass. It was like a margarita. So I had margarita <laughs> no all over me. Really? Yeah, because uh, back then I was I won't do that anymore. Yeah. But back then I was like, you give me anything, anything I'll try. I'll you know, it. and I would literally be messed up, you know, for the rest of the show because I had stuff. Yeah. On me. People, but, people had to love it though. Oh yeah, they were fun. Yeah, do it. Yeah, yeah. I've had people try to bring their children up. You know, you know Jug- babies. Jug- yeah. <laughs> Jug- on my baby. If you were going to give a piece of advice to someone who's just starting full time performing, oh, okay, they're going to do comedy and magic. They're going to do it full time. Yeah. And you were going to give a piece of advice that you felt like start off with this bit of information that you learned along the way. Any things that you would would tell them? Well. Get in front of an audience as much as you can. Yeah. And uh, they'll tell you what works and what doesn't work. I mean, that's pretty basic. That's gr- Well, that's huge, though. It's not yeah. like a musician who's practicing a piece of music and yeah. they know when they've got it right. Yeah. Because, yeah, some- I've, you know, come up with gags. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. <laughs> and it doesn't. Right. You're going, what's wrong with you, people? Right. And then, you know. That's the sometimes- best. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's just, and then you do stuff that you're just you'll like say, it's a throwaway. You so you'll say something on stage and it gets a huge rejection, and you're going, "Really, really? That's fine." But I keep yeah. it in because it's just, yeah, you know, because it gets a laugh every time. I never understood why does that get a laugh? Yeah, you know, <laughs> I can't That's think so of any funny. examples off the top of my head. Yeah, but I got but then, stuff like that. But then you have things that you thought of and you were like. I've oh, done this that. Is gonna kill. I've done that. Oh, I'm like, oh, I can't wait. I'm yeah. looking forward to the next gig. Or, you know, I'll come so up with a use. joke and I'll tell my wife, I go, what do you think about this one? Da 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 da. And she just kind of stares at you. <laughs> and I'm going, well, all right. Yeah. You know, then maybe, well, I'm going to try it out anyways. Yeah. <laughs> and, ah, she was right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, just get in for an audience, you know, and trust your sense of humor. You know, yeah. I, I get in for a long time. I, you know, it's like, the thing with the bird mom said, no, oh, try it. Yeah. And I was saying, no, it's funny in the living room, but not on stage. And I was wrong. It's like, okay, I got to start trusting what I think is funny. Yeah, that's good. And, and doing stuff like that. But yeah, I would go out uh, back in the 80s. You know, there was this magazine <coughs> that they used to have in Hollywood. I don't know if they still have it or not or, or anything like it, but it was called Drama Log. Okay. And in the back, they always had this these ads for... Showcases. Mm. It, oh, a lot of times they had auditions, you know, yeah. for you know union stuff, non union stuff, extra stuff, you know, for for film. Yeah, but they also had like an open mic kind of thing. Open or, mic, yeah. yeah. Back show they call them gong show nights, you know, because okay. the gong show gong was real show was popular. Huge, yep. And so a lot of people were producing these gong show nights mm. at restaurants, you know. So the restaurant liked it because it got people to come in and buy dinner. Yep. And uh, they got a you know a show out of it, and it didn't cost them very much money, you know, because yeah. all these acts would come in and compete. And the first prize was sometimes like a hundred dollars. Okay. Second prize was like fifty bucks. Yeah. The third prize was a dinner. Okay. You know, or you know, like that. I would go out to a lot of these, and and you're working, like, you're competing against comedians, jugglers, yeah, uh, uh, rappers, uh, uh, break dancers, yeah. And oh, when I saw a break dancer come in. Yeah, yeah. I, I, well, he's going to win. Yeah. They always won. Oh, yeah. They always brought the house. Down. Totally. And these guys were amazing. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I got a lot of dinners. 
and I would go and compete. But yeah. I wasn't really there for the win the money. I was just there to be in front of an audience. Yeah, work out the material. And uh, that's why I did those all the time, yeah. everywhere. There was like a circuit of them. And so right. I just did them constantly. And I would work with a bunch of guys that were now, you know, like friends of mine. You know, yeah. Are, Once you got known for the act and you had a good solid amount of time, mm-hmm. Was it challenging to put new stuff in because all of a sudden yes. now the act is like at this level and if I'm going to put something in new, mm-hmm. was that, I mean, was that scary? Well, especially, to, well, not if I'm doing a long show, yeah. you know, if I'm doing an hour show, it's easy to put something in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Bookend then, it like kind of thing. Like Warren Annabelle's, I do an hour. Okay. So it's easy to, that's where I slip a lot of new stuff in. Yeah, and slide in it, like five minutes here there. get it to yeah. a, you know, where a point where I can do it yeah. regularly on the outside. And then, uh, but like the castle, where yeah. you're doing 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Right. And people come there expecting to see Dana Daniels and Luigi. Yeah. And it's hard for me to try something new that might not actually kill. Yep. And they're expecting you know, right. the killer act. You know, And I want to give them the killer act. Yeah. So it's like I'm a little hesitant to try new stuff there. Yeah. How, how, so, do, you, how do you keep yourself motivated? Because the truth is... You've developed enough of a repertoire, and it's so good. You really could just continue to do that act, but you're always working on new pieces. How do you keep yourself motivated to do that? For me, it's just to keep it interesting for myself. You yeah. know, I get a little bored doing the same routines all the time, and then uh, and then once in a while, well, like at Warren Annabelle's, um, one of the acts I work with is John George. Yeah, I don't know if you know John. I know I, I don't know him personally, but yeah. we actually just this morning became Facebook friends. So oh, great! Maybe John and I will take, yeah. it, take it deeper. Well, John George <laughs> is—he used to follow me around when he was a kid. Yeah, when I was performing at Disneyland, wow. his dad worked there as a ride operator. And okay, John was like a young teenager, and he would follow me around. I have no memory of this. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of kids. Yeah, but so he was in the park all the time. And oh wow! That was one of the first magicians he ever saw. So. Uh, and now he's like this professional magician. Now I'm working alongside with him. Yeah. But John still has this um, little boy quality about him mm. towards magic. He's very excited about magic and oh, new yeah. tricks. And he's always bringing in new stuff and trying it out. And then he's always asking me, hey, you know, when I'm off, you know, and I, I go on an after and I close the show. And he goes, if you want to, you know, I can, I'm, back, I'm backstage. We could create a, maybe some other kind of you know, moment of magic, you know, I can oh, help yeah. you out, you know, from backstage and yeah. all that. So I'm like, and I already have my shows, like, right. well, you know, but I got, I got, it gets me thinking, yeah. like, oh, what could we do? That's so we cool. started doing stuff like that. Yeah. And it became very fun. Oh. And, it, and, and it just kind of motivated me, kind of gave me that, that little feeling of how I used to look at magic and yep. yeah, let's try new stuff. So I've been trying to, I've put a lot of new stuff in lately into my show. I yeah. keep on going, okay, let's try oh, it yeah. out. And, you know, I got this new routine I've been doing. It's, it's a prediction type routine. It doesn't even co- use the bird. Yeah. And I've uh, been doing it for a couple of years, but it's like completely different from the way it was when I first started it. Right. Because I finally found a hook for it. Or, yep. And, and it's getting big laughs. And, yeah. And plus, it's a killer, killer fuller. You know, it's so It's fun. a really good trick. So, uh, so there's that. You know, yeah. Some, someone comes along and gives you a little inspiration, you know, kind yeah. of remembers... Reminds you why you got in magic in the first place. Yeah. You know, so I, you know, cause yeah, I can get comfortable and just keep on doing the same thing. Yeah. So, and I bring stuff to the Magic Castle. It's new once in a while, especially in like the no show, which is my, yep. which you didn't talk about. Um, oh, yes. My, we, I want to talk my, about my uh, one man show I do with the piano player and all that. And all those characters. So I'm always throwing new stuff into that. Yeah. Let's talk about the no show because I remember this would have been in the 90s. Yes. Uh, maybe 98 or somewhere around there? 95. 95. Well, okay. I, I did the show 95 to 03. Okay. In there. So I Two remember the, f- I, and I had known of you from the castle and followed your, your performance and I'd known of you for years doing magic. And then I go to Disneyland one day with some friends from school mm. and I walk into the Golden Horseshoe and they're advertising they're going to do this show. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to sit down and watch a show. And I had no idea it was going to be you. Ah. And this show, I remember watching the show and going, this is the best magic show, comedy. Like, it's just brilliant. Oh, thank you. And it's all you and a piano player. Yeah. 
Where did this idea come from for the no show? Uh, after I left Disney in 1990, the, uh, in 95, they called and hired me to be a, to come up with some ideas yeah. uh, as a consultant for some street entertainment in the park. Okay. They were looking to have some new stuff. And yeah. so, uh, so I did that. And then in the meeting where I was presenting all my ideas, uh, they mentioned, director of entertainment mentioned, he says, oh, um, we have two days a week in the Golden Horseshoe that are dark. We don't have anything. In they, there. This was like Bill Hill and the Hillbillies? Bill day? Hill and the Hillbillies okay. are in there five yeah, days yeah, a yeah. week, but they okay. don't want to work them overtime. So they, they are dark two days a week. And he says, occasionally we just put a band in there, but we're getting complaints because it's not really a show. It's just a band playing music. Got it. So do you have any ideas for a show we can put in there that's... Um, um, you know, not a big expensive show, but you know, something you know small. And I said, yeah. I said, what, what days? And said, Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And I was like going, Tuesdays. And I love the horseshoe. The yeah. Horseshoes. Oh yeah. And I said, I know what you could put in there. You could put me in there. Yeah. And they said, well, one guy, that wouldn't really work. You yeah. know. And I said, of course it would. I said, I've worked the room many times in the Golden Horseshoe. I said, what do you remember about the Golden Horseshoe? You remember the comedian. Yeah. I mean, everything else was great, too. You remember the can-can answers. But really, right. the comedian is what yeah. everyone always talked about. Totally. So I said, it would work. And they were going, well, I don't know. And then I, and then out of, I don't know where it came from. Like, just out of, out out of nowhere. I'm just, I'm desperate. Yeah. So I just can't, I just said, well, then how about this? How about a, uh, how about a variety show and none of the acts show up and the guy who mops the floors has to do all the acts? Brilliant. And they went. That's great. You can do that? And I said, yeah. And they said, so good. Done. They're like, when can you start? Whoa. And I said, you do no realize, way. I said, you do realize it's still just me doing my act, right? It, which you didn't like a moment ago. And they go, yeah, but this is like a story now. Oh. It has, in yeah. Disney loves stories. Yep. So it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The guy who mops the floors is going to save the day, uh. you know, and, uh, and then I said, well, I'm going to need a piano player who has some live music and some guy I can bounce lines off of. And then, yeah. and then they said, let's just try it with just you mm. and some recorded music. And so we did. The very first day, Okay. I did the show with recorded music. Yeah. And, uh, um, and it went great. Yeah. Uh, but afterwards they said, you know, I think you're right. You think you need live music. Mm -hmm. My music, yeah, because yep. because uh, I was doing all my costume changes on stage. Because you couldn't leave, there's I couldn't no leave one else. I couldn't leave the stage empty, there. yeah. So right. I had to do all that, and it was yeah, it was kind of a weird thing. Mm. So it was, uh, and so once I had, then they brought in Richard Allen, yeah. And that's had you I, worked with Richard before? No, it's the first okay. time I ever met him. But actually, I had worked with him before. My very first cruise ship I ever worked back in 1980, 1985 was aboard the Azure Seas, mm. and Richard was the uh, unknown to me. Was the uh, music director? Wow! So he was behind me, and you didn't know you had no, had no idea. We didn't discover this until just a few years ago. Real Richard after you've been talking, working together, all, we've been working together for twenty <laughs> years. And then I was like saying, uh, da, da, da. and he was like, you know, I was a music director on the Azure you know. And I said, when? when? And he goes, and I'm like, I go, wait a minute, I was on the board the Azure in '85. And he goes, oh wow! And he goes, yeah, I was probably behind you. He goes, we had so many acts, I don't remember them all, you know. That's and I'm wild. like. That's so, that's so weird. It is a very small, small and weird world. Yeah, but anyways, that's where I first met Richard, and yeah, the show uh, that was called the Variety Show. Yeah, you know, they asked me, "What do we call it?" And I said, "I don't know, just call it the Variety Show." Yeah, and then later on, I changed after we left Disney. I changed it to the No Show, which and, is brilliant, and changed the character, you know, characters around stuff like that. And it's and it's continued to evolve, but I mean, you just did it at the castle. Well, yeah, and you know, it's so great. It's like Richard and I are so in tuned to each other. Yeah. Uh, Richard and I haven't done the show together. I have another piano player, too, I do the show with. So, but Richard hadn't done it in two years. Okay. And we just did a week at the castle. Yeah. We didn't rehearse at all. I mean... Not at all. We showed up, and I just kind of said, okay, here's the order. Blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. And, we got, and I have a new character, which, yeah. you know... And he's done once, I think, with me. And, and you had just come back, right? Because you started the castle. I, you just got back from Maui. Hawaii. Yeah. yeah. And then the next day I started the castle. And it's just like, yeah, I had to spend the whole day <laughs> gathering up all this stuff. <laughs> so I got there and we just talked it through a little bit. And then we literally just, but it was 
so funny because it was like 15 minutes of showtime and I'm not even in my costume yet. I go, really? Yeah. Oh, really? It's like stuck everything on real quick. And then, and then now it's like they start it and he yeah. starts the overture. And I'm like, what do I say? Opening line? You know, I'm going, <laughs> line, line. And I'm going okay. And went up there and it was just. It just worked. It went, it just like, we just work off each other. And if we mess up, we call ourselves on each other. Yeah. It's that, that kind of show. Where, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. we break the fourth wall completely. Totally. I mean, I'm like saying, you didn't read the script, did you? Yeah. You know, I'll say that to him on stage. Yeah. I was like, well, are we going off script now? You know, there's in da da blah, blah, blah. And the audience loves that stuff. Yeah. It's like that Carol Burnett kind of thing. Totally. Or he makes me laugh because he's very funny. He, yeah, he comes yeah. up with some lines and I say, that's in the show now. Yeah, you know, a lot has of he stuff. ever caused you to break on stage? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. He's hard to break on stage. Is he really? But I've done it. But it's he's hard. He's a hard nut to crack <laughs> that way. Yeah, yeah. So he's got good. some funny ideas. I seriously love the No Show. It is one of my favorite all time shows. Oh, thanks. Yeah. It's... So if you're listening to this and you see the No Show coming up at the Castle or anywhere, get to it and see it. So Absolutely. Good. Well, man, I know we could keep talking here. Yeah. But I know we got a fridge guy coming at sometime. Get my refrigerator fixed. That's a big deal. Yeah, the ice machine. Yeah, no ice. That's not. I good. love ice, man. Me too. I can't. This is not Europe. No, no. <laughs> we like ice in our drinks. Oh, absolutely. So, well, Dana, thank you for doing this, man. Oh, my pleasure. Time. How can how can people get a hold of you? How can they see what you're doing? Follow along. Uh, DanaDaniels.com. Awesome. Facebook Dana Daniels fan page. Dana Daniels fan page on Facebook. I'll put a link in the show notes so people can just click on there oh, if they great. listen to this. And great. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's I usually post where I'm going to be. Awesome. What I'm doing. You gotta, people got to check out your Dana Point album on Facebook. Yeah. It, it Pointed, like, a lot. I've been doing that for over 20 years, pointing at stuff. So fun. And uh, yeah, I still got a lot of points on my bucket list. Yeah. So. What's, what's one of the biggest points other than the, the Netherlands? What's well, something I don't you know what point the at? point is over there, but uh, <laughs> what the point at? It must be something. Yeah. It's got to be something that people recognize. You know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Iconic. Yeah. And I have a great deal of them. On the list. What is on the list? Um, the Hollywood sign. You've never done one of the Hollywood signs? Unbelievable. I have not yeah. done the Hollywood sign. Yeah. I've done Grommens. <laughs> okay. But yeah, you think something that easy. Right. But I just haven't bothered to do it yet. I'm waiting. I want to get a really good shot of it. I want to like yeah, call up be, there yeah, and no. be next to it. Yeah, you can do the little hike up to it, but I, I think the hike gets you behind it. Yeah, yeah. I'm not we're, sure. I've never been up there, so I don't know. We're going to have to break the law and just Yeah, so maybe you can help me out with that. One night in jail. Yeah. We'll, we'll do a kickstarter to raise I can the do Dana Point money. in jail, you know? Dana Point in jail. Dana. <laughs> There's some other ones. I have a little list. For, no, I don't have them in front of that. Yeah. yeah. But there are some other. Uh, I, I'd love to do one of the, the pyramids. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, that. I've been all through Europe. I got, you know, all the big oh, yeah. band and yep. Eiffel Tower. Art to Triumph. And, and yeah, I got all Coliseum that stuff. But, stuff yeah, yeah got, got, got all those. Yeah, but the, uh, so the pyramids I like to do. That's awesome. Well, go on Facebook, check out Dana's Dana Point album, and uh, for the right fee, Dana will come and point at you and your family. <laughs> that's right. I got. I do have a picture of Dana Carvey, me pointing at Dana Carvey. Oh, that's fantastic. I should have had him pointing at me. After where I took the picture, I thought, uh, well, I should have had Dana pointing at me, but... That's really Or it's pointing at each other. See, now as we're wrapping up, I've got all these questions. We're going to have to do another one of these sometime. All right. But we'll do a follow-up, but I'll, I'll push stop on this, and I'll ask you a couple more questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, man. Bye.